Hi everybody, uh, this is Ismail again. This is uh, lecture number nine. This is the last lecture of all the lectures for this course. Next week, lecture five will be, lecture 10, sorry, will be a recap of all nine lectures between me and Mohammed. We will send it to you. Now, today's lecture, we're going to talk. So, so far, you, you've been through from the day, from the day that you start demolition up to the day today we're going to finish up to the handing over of that building so we gave you an, an idea of how to manage a site from the from a to z today we're going to wrap it up with all the external work on the job plus handing over an occupation certificate but before we do that i just want a tiny bit recap about last week lecture when we talked about stairs and we talk about the finishes Okay, so with stairs, there's few terms you just need to be familiarized with. These terms are basically, you know, the stair is supported by an edge from the top or a wall or support from the bottom. These are steps and this is the waist of the stair. The effective length of the stair usually it's from the landing to half landing knee. Yeah, and note number of steps. Uh, for uh, up according to the BCA is 18 risers now riser is this is called riser and this is called a tread and this is the waist or the thickness of your uh, stairs now the tread has the nosing and going so always remember that formula regarding R plus G which we'll do in a second type of stairs few types of stairs we talked about the straight flight and again sometimes you can't achieve if you have a certain number of rises over 18 you need to introduce a landing a straight flight as you can see it's a one straight run and sometimes it has a landing sometimes it doesn't have a landing then you have your return flight where it returns yeah, with half landing or a 90 degree flight sometimes you have a 40 degree 45 degree flight so there's various style of of stairs now with the stairs according to the the bca which is the building code of australia it's called ncc now it specified that each flight has a maximum riser of 18 not more than 18 and minimum riser of two now the formula for these stairs usually it's 2R plus G is around between 550 and 700 maximum the average is around 650 now this is the rise and this is the go so that's the total number of rise and that's the height and that's the total go right the finish top of flight floor levels from here and that's the finish bottom each riser and go is equal for any given flight of stairs so the top and the bottom and all between so there shouldn't be any big difference into the rises from step to step otherwise you're going to have an issue they should be the same height all of them now according to the bca um, again um, the head height of these stairs so the minimum landing is 750 millimeter and the reason being is when you stand in here and imagine you have a door you need to be able to open the door and still walk so this is a landing so the minimum length of this landing is 750 the minimum headroom which is the head height is two meters and usually you take this line from the nosing so from the nosing above the nosing line to the one above it or the waist above it or the line above it that should be two meters maximum uh, minimum nothing under two meters otherwise it doesn't comply that's for the stairs now for the finishes we talked about schedule of finishes schedule of finishes it's a room by room list finishes set by the client and the designer and it looks like that and you can see it specify the rooms it specify the items what kind of items we're talking about what's the model if you have the model and the description of it and who's the supplier now you have to differentiate between the schedule of finishes and the marketing finish marketing finishes is when what they present you when you buy the apartment or the townhouse or the house itself so it gives you a small brief not in too much detail 
about all the kitchenware, the tapware, the bathroom fitting, what kind of ceiling you're having, what kind of uh, walls you're having, the kitchen stone, uh, the appliances, uh, the white goods and so forth. Um, a lot of developers to make life easy and to make it look more looking so you, they will have something called finishes schedule or finishing board sorry that's the finish board and that's based on the finish schedule it's just a, a board like that it tells you for example this is the kind of timber we're gonna use in the living room this is the kind of carpet we're gonna be using that's how it looks like so it gives you a feel and understanding of of what need to be uh, what need to be built and it gives an indication as well to the boys on site when they're building so now and sometimes you have two color scheme and then you have to go by that now with finishes we talked about the floor finishes okay where we have the natural finishes like the hardwood uh, a small example of the hardwood okay we talked about the soft wood and the soft pine uh, like this sort of stuff and we have talked about the tongue and groove finishes and still in talking in natural finishes you have these hardboard which is they use just uh, you know they're very inexpensive surface it's just used for short term for protection of tiles of protection of the timber flooring and so forth with the natural finishes as well we spoke about the medium the mdf which is in the medium density fiberboard and usually these sort of stuff are used in carcasses of joinery um you know they're very very cheap as well they're around 30 mil 3 mil now with the floor finishes as well with the natural finishes we talked about the tiles there's the quarry tiles very old style tiles you see them in the old houses and the the, the, the you have as well the ceramic and um porcelain tiles which shown everywhere lately you know and you get your mosaic tiles that looks like that they come into sheet now with the flooring as well we talked about pavers brick and pavers that they used in the old uh, path people still use them there are some nice pavers these days and we talked about as well the some expensive natural finishes like the marble and they're using them now that big big slabs of marble in the in the kitchen in the bath in the bathrooms now with the floor finishes we talked about nat natural the synthetic finishes like the vinyl and it comes into like planks as you say it's cheaper than obviously than the um, than the other floor finishes than the natural floor finishes and you have as well the epoxy resin that's used mainly in commercial or in garages where you want to have that nice looking garage and flooring and they're easy to wash okay and to maintain with the finishes we talked about wall finishes wall and ceiling finishes um, you know walls you could be tiled could be dressed with timber or could be painted simply painted spray painted ceiling finishes the majority of ceiling in Australia are lined with shades of gibrock trimmed with either cornices square square set or shadow line so um, yeah then we spoke as well about the white goods and the appliances so the white goods you have your they call them white goods i call them appliances um, stoves cooktops wall oven refrigerators dishwashers clothes dryers washing machine range hood and so forth and this is a picture of some of the appliances that were used on many projects now with the fixing out and trims the most common trims are used are the skirting cornices arc trays lining and angles uh, we touch based about our kitchens as well and the type of kitchens we have like there are many ways you can plan your kitchen up to five basic classic plans used you have the one wall plan you have the gallery plan you have the l-shaped plans u-shaped plans and the island plan now that's it for the recap let's let's start a bit with our um, lecture today today we're going to talk about external work and in external work what, what does external work means it's anything outside the building not outside the boundary it will it include as well outside the boundary 
So anything outside the building that's need to be done on the outside, like external work, public domain, anything like footpath, driveways and so forth, we'll explain it in a second. Then you need to hand over that building and provide your occupation certificate. So first you reach your practical completion. Then there is the occupation certificate and I'll explain to you in details what's occupation certificate and what does, that, what does it involve. Then you have your handing over packages and then you have the defects liability which is a very important um, item in the handing over because it gives you an indication who, where, where the defects are, who, who is responsible of these defects. Okay, so let's start with our external work and let's start specifically with landscaping. What's landscaping? Well, usually when you have landscaping, you can't just do whatever you want. There's a landscaping plan that's required in the DA approval and in most council, yeah? Uh, in a very simple term, landscaping is basically the gardening and planting plants to meet um, the council requirement because council has each, each council has a certain requirement. Landscaping plan usually is prepared by a landscape architect and it outlines the following. First, the all our building outlines, the path, the driveways, and the hard features. So you have hard landscaping and soft landscaping. And it's all shown on the landscape plan. All the major proposed planting, as I said, councils sometimes have a specific because some council got toward the green, um, the, the green uh, landscaping, so more, more trees, a lot of trees. And some council, they just don't care. All major proposed planting, specific garden beds, so all your planter boxes as well. Specific features in arbors and seeds, ponds and paths, which is called hard landscaping. And of course you showed your irrigation system and how you're going to run your water through the landscaping. You have your retaining walls shown on the landscaping and existing and new fence. All, all of these are shown. I'll show you an example of a landscaping plan. It looks like that as you can see this is a house up in um, in Willoughby uh, and uh, what it is it shows you all the soft landscaping all around the hard landscaping of all the pavers on the outside the hard landscaping with the driveways the planter boxes in here the, the planter boxes in here the turf this is an internal garden it shows you a lot of things and in here it specified each item of these components on these plans are specified into here in that table and gives you a photo. This is a detailed landscape plan. Um, there's another landscape plan for another project that shows you the, um, the hard work, uh, uh, the, soft, the hard plan, you know how we said soft landscaping and hard landscaping, this is the hard landscaping. So it shows you all the tiling in the common area and barbecue areas, it shows you all the seatings in here all the seating, the steps and, and so forth, everything is shown in here and all the uh, fences in between the apartments and the planter boxes. Sometimes in the landscape plan it will be a detailed landscape plan showing you all the components. It's very similar to a finished schedule. It's like it shows you the pavers, what kind of pavers, where they're going to be looking. It shows you the furniture, the landscape furniture. I'm talking about the seating, the, the barbecue, the uh, the bench, the uh, bin. Uh, this is a specific project up in Mascot where council, we were doing uh, part of the council because an area was dedicated to council, a council requiring a certain number of certain uh, specific seating and specific bins. All right, I'll give you some photos from lot of soft landscaping that we've done on our project uh, block of townhouses. You can see all the soft, all the planters, uh, all the, 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 all the planters are here, turf, you can see here even the fences we shown them, okay, and they're all shown on the landscape plan. And this is a soft landscaping in here, we have, we had to do all on the external, outside the boundary, we put, we had to do all the footpaths, the curbs and gutters, all the turf laid, and you can see all the pavers in here. That's another photo in here, we'll give you an indication of what we're talking about. This is the same job in um, uh, in Kellyville. Now, with external work, we're going to touch base about public domain. What's a public domain? Public domain is a set of construction plans that detail everything, clarifies and show the existing and proposed public domain elements surrounding the development site. So public domain, as I said, anything has to do with footpaths, gutters, driveways, 
for public which is outside the boundary uh, stormwater pit they're all part of the public domain okay so we said include this this public domain includes and it will be shown on a plan the signs the street furniture the street trees the planting the boundaries curb and gutter alignment vehicle crossing pedestrian curb ramps street lights and so forth it also may include changes to the road drainage infrastructure footpath as required to meet council requirement work required re work work required to reconstruct the public domain fronting the site to meet the city's current standard now no work no public domain work is permitted no work is permitted uh, on public road without local authority approvals otherwise a big fine will apply so you can't expect you to go and start doing a footpath and close the road without getting the approval from local authority local authority could be council could be rms uh, could be um you know sydney trains anything public authorities right um what are we doing here Generally, generally, um, public domain are required to be approved by have a bit of a trouble with the system. Here you go. And the public domain, sorry, just, just, yeah, the generally the public domain plan are required to be approved by local authorities prior to issuing of the construction certificate. Okay, so you're not allowed to do any construction without the approval and public domain specification are issued by local council because each council has a certain specification with the curb, how does it look like, or, you know, um, where's the gutter is going to be located, the driveway, the extension, the extent of the driveway. And the public domain, as I said, has to be approved by council and about by the local authority and it has and it usually who does the public domain uh, plans usually the civil engineer are uh, involved in this like this one for example is a public domain done and you can see it was approved it shows in here all that you know all that footpath in here with the stormwater extra stormwater pit required and so forth and that got approved by council before they start the work and you can see on the plan itself it shows you all the details of the, the paving layout as well and that's that's all part of the landscaping but again this plan has to be submitted to the local authority because it's on public uh, public areas um, this is all the layback of the driveways curb and gutter um, how high is the curb how wide is the gutter and so forth some photos of a public domain of a job that we've done up in uh, Marubra um, so you can see here how the curb and gutter is done in here that's how it's done everything is dug everything is done and that was that was the road was for council so we had to take all the approval from council to do the curb and gutter and we had to upgrade some roads as well according to council requirement at this stage you realize this road is not asphalt it's just pure concrete and that's it, it this is where where council specify their work okay public domain as well on another job you can see some retaining wall done in here and you can see the footpath so this is the curb and gutter this is the footpath before pouring the concrete so that's basically what the, the external work finishes um, landscaping and uh, public domain now let's start with uh, handing over the site and the occupation certificate so with the occupation certificate we're going to talk about practical completion because practical completion is basically different than occupation certificate they can be the same or they can be different it depends what's specified in the contract okay ending of package and defect what's oc what's occupation certificate occupation certificate is achieving completion of a building project okay and usually it's one of the hardest job at all so 
sometimes it's very complicated to get all this occupation certificate over the line because is there's a lot of details that you need to go through a lot of conditions that you need to satisfy in order to forget this OC so the best way to obtain the completion is to have a detailed plan and good choice of subcontractors they make your life easier and always be prepared so once construction and all final inspections are completed by all your subcontractors and all your subbies and PCA everyone so now your authority the authority can and in PCA you can achieve the completion and start the process of handing over the site okay but prior to handing over the project to the client OC need to be obtained okay so no one is allowed to occupy or to move in unless the occupation certificate is issued or interim ish OC is issued okay so go back to PC which is practical completion when is the practical completion achieved for a project? One, the project is safe to occupy. Yeah, it's, it can be used, it can be occupied. The construction and the final build is in according with, it, when it's, with, it, with, it, with the building code of with the National Code of Australia or BCA and relevant st Australian standards. And the construction adheres uh, to, the to the relevant um, authorities. So everything is according to the authorities and the A consent issued by council at the A stage. So everything, so all the construction has, you have to tick all the boxes related to all the authorities, all the DA conditions and everything. <coughs> now, again, more points about when practical completion is achieved. Now, there should be a series of final inspection completed by the private certifier or the private authority could be council as well and relevant consultant to ensure the following so the roof drainage is properly plumb everything is working properly no leakage nothing all the handrails and balustrades are completed in accordance with the relevant standards all the necessary sanitary facilities are all present and working everything is working water cannot penetrate the building envelope otherwise it's not it's not a place where you can live. You need to make sure you're watertight. All the wet areas are properly waterproofed and tiled and finished. Smoke detectors should be in place and fully operational just in case of fire. Permanent services are there in terms of sewer, in terms of water, in terms of electrical. Everything should be operational or working. And then you should be have a final survey inspection. Right? So... When we talked about practical completion it's simple the project is safe to be occupied okay the construction is completed everything is working ready to go ready to move in you still have no OC but you reach practical completion so you can tell the client yep we reached the practical completion why well, now we're ready to hand over now we're ready to get our occupation certificate now what is occupation certificate so it's a certificate that allows you to occupy the project and to move in. It's a piece of paper by the private certifier, could be council or private certifier. So it allows the project to be settled and the deed can be registered. So you can reach practical completion, but that job is still in the name of the developer. It has not moved to the new set tenants. So occupation certificate will allow that, that progression or that, that movement from the uh, and, and move of the deed from, from the developer to the tenant. It's issued after the inspection of the building is done and all adhere to the approved plans. So everything is working and it ticks all the boxes. And it allows the residents to move in. Okay. And the defect liability period starts after the OC. So usually once you achieve occupation certificate you start your defect liability period so let's say if there was a delay not, not saying that there is no liability on the builder before the issue of oc the issue the builder is liable but let's say if you finish the job you reach practical completion and it took you six months to reach oc the defect liability period, which is six years for major, major defects, starts straight after the OC. So even if the building has been finished for one year, so this, the defect liability period, it's after the OC. 
Okay, now how to obtain the occupation certificate? Usually the private certifier will issue a sort of checklist and in that checklist uh, you will have components that related to the DA and uh, some components related to other items. But the private certifier, as we said before, it could be the council or it could be a private accredited certifier, a private uh, firm. Okay, and each private certifier has a certain format for his checklist. Council have a format, private certifiers has different format, but the bottom line is the conditions has to be the same. You have to satisfy the condition of council, you have to satisfy a certain fire safety requirement and general BCA requirement. So, generally, your OC checklist will cover three types of certification. You have your DA condition certification, you have your fire safety certification, so anything related to fire, smoke detectors, smoke alarms, sprinklers, uh, FBI, we spoke about that in the fire indicating panel, FIP, sorry. And you have your general BCA certification, which is the structural, um, the building is structurally adequate, so you need a structural certificate, the building stormwater is working, the work is executed of the stormwater and so forth. I'll, I'll show you an occupation certificate checklist that's been issued by the client, by the private certifier. And you can see here, each condition, because if you read the A condition, if you take a set of the A conditions and you start reading through it, you'll find that there are uh, some conditions that um, there are some conditions related to uh, to occupation. It, they will say you you cannot issue an OC before you satisfy, let's say, DA condition 65, which is, for example, here it's what is it? It's a DA. It's a, it's detailed survey that the RLs are according to the guidelines and as per approved plans. Okay, so that's a checklist. So you go through each and every item of that checklist. You provide your answers to the private certifier and you submit it in. Okay, so this is this is this is the general um, uh, BCA requirement that we're talking about. When we talked about structural engineering, you need certification to to say that yeah, it comply with the BCA. You need your civil engineer to provide you with another certificate saying the plumbing and the stormwater is according to plans and according to the BCA. You have some certification related to the BASIC certification. Yeah, it's according, this building has been built according to the BASICS report. And you have a certificate that the builder provides you saying, yeah, that building is, I've built that building according to the BCA. Okay. And the fire engineer, even the lift, you need to have a certification for it. Now, as you can see, this is another, uh, this is the component that has the fire certification issues, which is, okay, there is a fire hose reels, you need to provide a certificate that need to be tagged. There is a um, fire alarm monitoring system, like an FIP we spoke about. Um, the fire hydrant system is working well. The fire seals are done. The caulking has been done. You know, all the sort of stuff has related to fire safety as well need to be checked. Okay. Now, once you have that checklist, there's another item as well. Like from not only from like as a paperwork the building should be completed and fully operational so you need to have reached your practical completion basically you need to have all your testing and commissioning completed okay and your bca or PC, pca and for a council will do their final inspection um okay once builder achieve all these items in the checklist and all final inspection completed, then the private certifier will issue an occupation certificate. Okay, an occupation certificate it's a, it's a, it's a piece of paper. I'll show it to you in a second. I'll show you a photo of it. Now, once you reach occupation certificate and you got that piece of paper, now what's next? Okay. Once all your items to be checklist are satisfied and your private certifier issue an OC. The builder has to hand over now the site to the developer or the, to the tenant or the owner of the building. And most of the builders, they provide you with handing over package, uh, will handed, uh, it will be handed to the developer. Okay. There's, uh, in some projects, you need to have a strata. So a strata company is assigned to manage the property. A house, you don't need a strata, but a block of, dup or block of uh, a duplex, you don't need a strata, but a block of uh, townhouses, block of units, you need your strata company to be assigned. That's, that's mandatory. Okay. And then straight away, the defect liability period to start. 
so the defect any defect that happening on the job now the builder is liable now resident can move in this is an example of an occupation certificate uh, that looks like that it's very simple this is a final occupation certificate it gives you the detail of the property who's the authorities who's the council who's the applicant the developer and so forth and it shows you okay the scope of, of approval the whole building okay this is a block of 26 townhouses now once um, OC is issued president can move in we talked about the hand over packages okay um, handing over package it's just a package that um, contains all the information related to the property and usually it contain the welcome and guarantee letter that we can guarantee the building that we built we build it according to the code you know and then you give them all the trade the information so if something happened they need to call the trade they need to call the builder all the details of all these subcontractors on the job they worked on the job are they so builders and trade information from phone numbers to emails to addresses and, and what kind of work they've done you have to give them like a maintenance schedule and preventive maintenance and finishes so in your preventive maintenance you talk about let's say the gutters has to be cleaned uh, the stormwater pit has to be cleaned regularly if there is uh, a lift that lift has to be maintained to a certain if you have uh, your your fire uh, you know your, your uh, booklets for the pumps how they should work and what's um, you know what's the maintenance and every six months or every three months all these details has to be in this uh, handover package and you have to have all your warranties and manuals so if you support your acs you need to show them all the warranties and all the manuals for all the appliances and the, that you've installed on the job all the remote controls all the keys all the access cards everything has to be in that handing over it should be self-explanatory uh, the client has to go through it and if they have any problem they will read it Now, once you do the handing over, we talked about the defect liability period it starts. Now, what's a defect liability period? Under the construction contract, yeah? One of the contractor's primary obligation is to, to carry out and complete the works to the standard set out in the contract and plans. The defect liability period is intended to complement this liability by setting out how and when the contractor must remedy the defective work so it's it's a it's a period of time where they have to go back and fix their problems and every project has defects do you not gonna find a project that's gonna be defect free but you need to make sure and a good builder always go back and fix his defects and defect liability period starts on the completion of the work under the contract and is issue and the issue of the occupation certificate. As I said, the, uh, the, this is the, de the the line that with with the defect liability period. So the length of most building projects varies from six to twelve months. This is the the, the defect. But complex engineering projects such as power station, it can be as long as 24 to 36 months. And this is we're talking about minor defects. But when we talk a major defects, we're talking about six years. Okay. So any builder that built a house, even the defect liability period, let's say it's a 12 month. If a door handle, you know, is not working properly, if a lock is not working properly, you have a bit of, uh, you know, leaking. Uh, well, leak is a major defect. You have a bit of. Uh, touch up paint need to be done the carpet is defected so forth this is for one year for example okay but major defects the waterproofing structural defects any cracking in the building any waterproofing issues any leaking issues the builder is has to provide six years warranty on this one all right so when we talk about defect as i said defect must result from a defective design or faulty workmanship defective materials or a failure to comply with the structural performance requirement under the code of australia and national code the most common defect in new premises are waterproofing wall cracking um, tiling issues and roof leaks okay now if you're unsure about an item and your premises has a defect uh, there's a guideline and some tolerances 
for your defect so you can't just again say oh everything is a defect there's some guidelines and there are some this will give you a uh, the, this website will give you um, from the fair trading it give you a uh, um, the tolerances that required so sometimes you can have a little cracking which is generally it's okay people building settle but when you have a major crack a big crack and you measure it according to the guidelines of tolerances you find that it's really a defect then you call the builder to fix it this is an example of some defects so you can see there's a bit of a wall cracking in here that's not a major that's a, just a minor crack but you still have to call the defects in the beginning just to patch it and fix it not an issue okay here some defects you seen on building how the planter was not waterproof properly and need to be waterproofed and you can see okay. here the defect is the tiles were not were not laid properly and there was ponding in the shower this need to be fixed you can't have a ponding uh, water in the shower people will slip and fall and have an issue okay so these are these are some major uh, some defects that we've shown um, basically that's it for today we touched base on all the buildings from a to z from the day you do demolition to the day you have your occupation certificate and defects liability period look i hope you enjoy the lectures unfortunately we were not able to attend these lectures due to that virus that hit all of us by just a matter of time and everything will go back to normal um, i wish you all the luck and good luck in your in the future and um, thank you for uh, listening bye bye